Okay, so we, I went over the kind of the beginning um, last week. The main takeaway was that um, ggplot2 uses like the HCL, which is hue, chroma, and luminance color space. Uh, and then, yeah, so getting into 11.2 continuous color scales. Um, the color gradients are often used to show the height of the 2D surface. Um, the plots in the section of the surface of the 2D, 2D density estimate of the faithful data set, which records the waiting time between eruptions and during each eruption of the old faithful geyser in Yellowstone Park. And I think this note was kind of saying that um, they spell color with the U, like the British spelling, but you can also use it with the, like a, the US C-O-L-O-L-O-R versus C-O-L-O-U-R. Um, okay, so particular palettes. Uh, oh, and also I, just to note, I have the videos kind of minimized. So if you have any comments, just unmute because I won't be able to see you. Um, okay, there are multiple ways to specify common color scales. You can use to you can construct your own palette, but it's unnecessary because there are many hand-picked palettes. Um, ggplot2 supplies two scale functions that bundle pre-specified palettes, scale fill vertice C and scale fill distiller. The vertice scales are designed to be perceptually uniform in both color and when reduced to black and white and to be perceptible to people with various forms of color blindness. Um, so this is the first one where it's just the erupt. And then this is using scale vertice. And then this one, we use the particular scale vertice magma color scale. And then the second group of continuous color scales built into ggplot are derived from the color brewer scales. scale scale fill brewer, which provides these colors as discrete palettes, while scale fill distiller and scale fill fermenter are continuous binned analogs. So this is scale fill distiller, and then scale fill distiller using the palette, um, I think it's, I guess, red purple, RDP. I didn't get a chance to look everything up. Um, and another one with a different palette. And then there's also scale fill, uh, it go, uh, provides palettes that are perceptually uniform and suitable for scientific visualization. And they use like different palettes. And then a particular, a particularly useful package is Palettier, which aims to provide a common interface. So then with, yeah, so with Palettier, you can use um, the Viridis, package like in this one where they use the plasma and then this one that uses the I feel like I'm pronouncing it wrong Siko Siko um Tokyo color palette and then yeah and then oops there's a other oh thank you June the um there just got three more color palettes cool okay and then, yeah, and then this one, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, I feel like that's a Game of Thrones reference that I have no idea what it is because I've never used Game of Thrones, <laughs> never watched Game of Thrones, but <laughs> all right. Um, the, the red um, is blood, basically. Hmm? Uh, in Game of Thrones, the red the red is for blood, I think. Oh, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, okay. So robust robust recipes. Um, the default the default scale for continuous fill scales is scale fill continuous, which in turn defaults to scale fill gradient. As a consequence, these three commands um, produce the same plot using a gradient scale. So basically erupt is the same as erupt plus scale fill continuous, which is the same as scale fill gradient. And then the gradient scales provide a robust method 
for creating any color scheme you like. Um, you just specify two or more colors um, and ggplot2 will interpolate linear, linearly between them. And the three functions that you can use for this purpose are scale fill gradient, which produces a two color gradient, like you see here, scale fill gradient two, which produces a three color gradient with a specified midpoint, for example, this one, and then scale fill gradient n produces an n color gradient. And that is this one, yeah. And then, yeah, they chose the colors here. Uh, colors terrain and then yeah with the um gradient two where it has a midpoint color um the midpoint is white the midpoint color is white and then you also specify the midpoint there as 0 0.02 and then there's also like the Munsell color system which provides an easy way of specifying colors based on their hue chroma and luminance the Munsell package provides easy access to the Munsell colors, which can then be used to specify a gradient scale. For more information on the Munsell package, see this. Let's see. Let me go. Oh, let me show the window. Okay. Sorry. Uh, how do I share that one? Um, oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, this just is more information on the monthly package. Um, yeah, I didn't get to fully look this over yet, but yeah, this um, would lead to the Git, um, the GitHub repo for the package. Let me go back to my page. Okay. And I think um, so. Where it's annotated these arrows, um, these are the specific colors that were used to make this plot. Um, the three point gradient scales typically convey the perceptual impression that there's a natural midpoint. Uh, oh, that's for the next one. From which the other values diverge. Um, this would have the bottom one here would have been the left plot. But yeah, this plot um, shows how to create a divergent yellow blue scale. And that would be here. Yeah. So then the midpoint. Yeah. And then if you have colors that are meaningful to your data, e.g. black body colors or standard terrain colors, or you'd like to use a palette produced by another package, you may use an endpoint gradient. Um, so then these ones, the low ones use that. So this one, the also gradient on colors and different color spaces there. Um, and then you can find for more information on the color space package. You can go there. Ah. Okay. Those, I'm not really good with switching between these. Okay. So, yeah, this is pretty. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this is the, I guess, more information about color space uh, toolbox for manipulating stuff in color palette. So, so something to look into. Very pretty. Okay. okay, so missing values. All continuous color scales have an NA value parameter that controls what color is used for missing values, including values outside the range of color scales. By default, it is set to gray, which will stand out when you use a colorful scale. And if you use black and white scales, you might want to set it to something else to make it more obvious. Um, you can set na.value equal na to make missing values invisible or choose a specific color if you prefer. And this is that thing. 
Yeah. And then, so here, like, yeah, so here the missing, instead of it being gray, like in this one, they put any, um, na dot values equal to na so that bar the gray bar is just completely gone and then also you could like also they in this one they changed the color from the default color from gray and made it yellow instead and then limit breaks and labels you can suppress the breaks entirely by setting them to the null for accesses uh for axes this removes the tick marks grid lines and labels and for legends, this removes the key labels. Honestly, I did not fully understand this part. Um, I don't know if anyone has a better understanding of this. I think if you had if you had done it without like on that line that says labs x equals null y equals null oh so it just took out the oh yeah okay. then it would have defaulted to whatever those um those columns were okay. uh, up and i guess up and up maybe okay for some reason i thought it was still about color and i was like i don't understand okay that makes more no. sense <laughs> no it's, okay. it looks yeah, like it's more about the time. yeah more about the labels yeah, because it was this one down here where it's breaks equals null. Yeah, that part I wasn't sure about. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, I yeah. think this, um, hello. Um, yeah. the, the breaks are the breaks within uh, the two different uh, colors, uh, scale. So maybe. Um, Put in the breaks, no, you don't don't have uh, uh, like a gradient uh, oh. visualization of the the thing. Oh, okay. yeah, just break cool. and change color to uh, the, the other level, maybe. I don't know. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. We have discrete color scales. So for discrete color scales, um, discrete color and full scales occur in many situations. A typical example is a bar chart that encodes um, both position and fill to the same variable. Um, the default scale for discrete colors is scale fill discrete, which in turn defaults to scale fill hue. So these next two plots are identical um, for the bars and then bars plus scale fill discrete. And then also bars plus scale fill hue. Um, the brewer scales, um, scale, scale color brewer is a discrete color scale that along with the continuous analog scale color distiller and binned analog scale color fermenter uses hand cooked color brewer um, colors taken from, yeah, HDC, yeah, the color brewer. Um, these colors have been designed to work well in a wide variety of situations, although the focus on is on maps and so that the colors tend to work better when displayed in large areas. Um, there are many different options. Let me go to this website real quick. Thank you, June. <laughs> you have all the information on these. Let's see. The screen share. Okay. So this was what they meant with the color brewer being like really good on like um, maps, especially. Yeah. Ooh. And like you can change. Okay. Okay, so the first group of palettes um, are sequential scales that are useful when you, your discrete scale is ordered, like rank data, and are available for continuous data using scale color distiller. For unordered categorical data, the palettes of most interest are those in the second group. Set one and dug two are particularly good for points. 
and set two pastel one pastel two and accent works well for area so this is the top and then actually, yeah it's really scrunched up here so it's kind of hard hard to see what they oh, yeah. this is set one and set two and accent um, note that no palette is uniformly good for all purposes. Um, scatter plots typically use small plot markers and bright colors tend to work better for better than subtler ones. We have, yeah. Um, so yeah, these ones are like very bright versus these as they get lighter, it's kind of, well, especially on this one, it's very, very hard to see the point versus the first one where you have like the really bright, like the red and blue and green. And then bar plots usually contain large patches of color and bright colors can be overwhelming. So subtle colors tend to work better in this situation. So here, yeah, I don't think it's necessarily that overwhelming, but yeah, the bright, well actually, yeah, the bright red and blue and green versus as you put like the lighter, like pastel colors, it it's not, yeah, I could see it being less overwhelming. And um, so 11.32, hue and gray scales. Um, the default color scheme picks evenly spaced hues around HCL color wheel, and this works well for up to eight colors. But after that, it becomes hard to tell the diff different colors apart. Um, you can control the default chroma and luminance and the range hues with the HCL argument. So here you have bars, and then yeah, here they're changing the chroma. Oh no, the hue. Mm, yeah. And then one disadvantage of the default color scheme is that it is that because the colors are all have the same luminance and chroma, when you print them in black and white, they all appear as an identical shade of gray. Um, noting this, if you're intending a discrete color scale to be printed in black and white, it is better to use um, scale fill gray, which maps discrete data to grays from light to dark. Yeah. And then manual scales. If none of the hand-picked palettes are suitable, or if you have your own preferred colors, you can use Scaleful Manual to set the colors manually. <laughs> and this could be useful if you wish to choose colors that highlight a secondary group, um, grouping structure or draw attention to different comparisons. Yeah, so then these two on the left are both like the sienna color. And then these two on the right are like the hot pink color. So it gives a more um, distinction between the two. And then, but these ones are all from like the tomato, the tomato color. Yeah. And then these are, and then these ones, these three are gray. And then, yeah, having the black one just definitely draws attention to it. Um, you can use a uh, named, you can also use a named vector to specify colors to be assigned to each level, which allows you to specify the levels in any order you like. Yeah, I think, yeah, this is the same as that one. So D, C, C is black and A is gray. Okay. Okay, bend color scales. Um, color scales also come in bend versions. Um, the default scale is scale fill bend, which in turn defaults to scale fill step. Um, these scales have an end breaks argument that controls the number of discrete color categories created by the scale. Um, Counterintuitively, because the human visual system is very good at um, detecting edges, this can sometimes make the continuous color gradient easier to perceive. This one, scaffold bend. Yeah. Okay. 
one is. So yeah, so this one has the eight breaks, seven breaks. Seven. Yeah, so there's like the eight different colors, starting from this one and moving in. Um, I can't remember. So I guess these two are the same. In terms of it. Yeah, so these two are the same because scale fill bin defaults to scale fill steps. So those two are the same. And then this one where it has the eight breaks, so the eight um, colors within the gradient. And then in other respects, scale, scale fill steps is now this to scale fill gradient and allows you to construct your own two color gradient. Um, there's also three color variant scale fill steps two and n color scale variant <coughs> scale fill step n that behave similarly in their continuous counterparts uh, to their continuous counterparts. And this one where they're um, specifying the colors, where the low color is the gray and the high is the brown. And again, this one uses the midpoint where the mid mid color is white and the midpoint is 0 0.02. And this is um, the N steps one where they have, um, so the 12 different colors um, and the colors, yeah. And they use the terrain colors. And then a brewer analog for bin scales also exists and is called scale fill fermenter. This one I wasn't doing. Oh, this one. Frederica really liked this one. Okay. I think is that was one of the websites I pulled up before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think this was, yeah, I think this was one of the websites as well. Yeah. Um, and actually, I do have a question. Does anyone have like more information like regarding um, the skill um, scale fill fermenter versus distiller? I think distiller is the continuous version and fermenter is the discrete version, the bin version. Mm -hmm. So then these ones, basically it's like, there's already a set, a set number of colors versus versus it being a continuous scale? Well, the end breaks is sitting at the nine colors. Mm, right. Yeah. Right. But they're still using the color brewer um, scales palettes. So basically, I guess with the continuous one, you can't call breaks, is that it? Kind of thing? Right, it'd be smooth transitions oh. between the colors. Okay. Of... Yeah, okay. It's like the difference between scale color um, continuous and scale colored bend mm, yeah. or steps. Okay. So yeah, this one uses a different power. And the, and the note that like this discrete scale fill brewer, and unlike the continuous scale fill brewer, the bend function scale fill fermenter does not interpolate um, between the brewer's colors. And if you set n breaks larger than the number of colors in the palette, a warning message will appear and some colors will not be displayed. Okay. And then this one. And the alpha scales. Um, alpha scales map the transparency of a shade to a value in the data. They are often not useful, but can be convenient way to visually downweight less important observations. Scale alpha is an alias for scale alpha continuous, since that is the most common use of alpha. 
and it saves a bit of piping. Okay. So, yeah. so I actually thought this would take longer than it did. I didn't finish getting up to like legends um, and doing chapter 12. So I don't know if you guys wanted to talk about um, the GG plot. Um, what was it Tidy Tuesday? Now and then I continue next week, or I could just kind of power through it. I have it. Um, I have at least the plots plotted, but not necessarily to the point that I understand it and be able to talk about it. So yeah. What if uh, what if we let what if we did chapter twelve next week? You said you're still doing chapter twelve. Yeah. yeah. What if we did that and then I can try to ask some questions about um, Tidy Tuesday? Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. All right. Cool. Okay. So, um, so I, I I put this in the Slack just right before our call started about getting some some training for myself um, and I guess anybody else that needed it related to Tidy Tuesday. So, uh, so I have a New Year's resolution, which if I'm lucky, will make it out of January to do uh, to participate in the Tidy Tuesday. But I've never done it before, and I know that they publish a public data set on Tuesdays, and I think it ends up coming out. Um, I'm not even sure what what time of day it comes out in the United States. Um, maybe in the afternoon or so. Um, but late Monday night. Sorry. I think maybe late Monday night. Late Monday night. Let's see it. Okay. So yeah, I guess that makes sense. So um, in any case, like it goes to GitHub, right? So let me share, let me share my screen. Um, I'm hoping everybody can see a browser. Okay, good. So, um, so what I see here is the, and do I mention that I'm still fairly new to, to GitHub as well? So. Um, so what I see here is this R for data science, that's the, the account, right? And so then they've got a number of different repositories, one of which is Tidy Tuesday. But is it true that this Tidy Tuesday right here under the R for data science online, online learning community, this is the Tidy Tuesday. This is the main, the mothership Tidy Tuesday. That's correct. Okay, good. I'm seeing some head nods. All right, so then if you click under here under Tidy Tuesday, there's um, a few different folders. Um, and, and I think the key one here might be this data one. And it's broken out by year. And then, um, so if we were to click into 2021, we can see all of the data, data sets that were provided during, during that year. Um, I don't know if that's true under here. But I do see it down here. So these are all data sets that if you've even kind of followed it on Twitter or whatever, these all look familiar. They look familiar to me. Scooby-Doo, Olympic medals, um, I, I, Starbucks I know was recent too. So, so these are the data sets. Um, anybody stop and, and interrupt me if you have anything to add on this. So, so if we were to click here into, uh, what did I just click into? I clicked on what it said for Starbucks drinks here. This is under data source articles. So I click under here under Starbucks drinks data. And um, it, this is just a user's readme for this data set. Is this the user that provided the data set? So that that's uh, you you can access the data uh, the latest data from the, from the home page of the repo of the data Tuesday repo. You don't need to get inside the data uh, thing, but you you reach the 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 thing uh, as well uh, this way. Uh, you um, and these are the the links uh, that you need. It there's a, a little in, bit of introduction uh, about how to write a, a Twitter uh, with the um, with your Tidy Tuesday, and then this uh, a little bit of guidelines on 
about how to Twitter your Tidy Tuesday. Then if you scroll down a bit, but it just said, it just saying that you need to put uh, an explanation uh, underneath your uh, graph saying what type of graph it is it and uh, what, it, what is uh, represent just to, uh, to to leave some information about your your study Tuesday. And then if you see, this is uh, all the time the same as this. The things that change are the data, and these are Starbucks data. Uh, and when you, if you see in the reprex, uh, there is Starbucks, uh, Reader, Read CSV, just a little bit down here. No, 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 in the, in the gray part, uh, a little bit uh, there. The last line this, this is, yeah, the, the, la, the uh, yes. You, you can just uh, copy and paste this in your R and you, you have the data, or you can load, install the package, Tidy Tuesday R, it is a package. And then each uh, week of the year, um, this is the, the last one. You have two ways to load the data. Okay. And then once you, you, you can load either way, this is always the same data. And then uh, um, under a, a little bit on, uh, below this uh, um, is the explanation of, of the variables inside the data. So this then appears to be a, like a comprehensive place to get data definitions. From, so from this page here, you can get data definitions, you can see the contributor, you can download the data, there's code for doing that. You may even be able to do it manually if you wanted to download the actual CSV. Um, okay, that makes sense to me. Ryan, if you don't mind me jumping in just briefly. Please. So this is a markdown uh, document. And if you were to view it in the raw form, uh, those hyperlink names or hyperlink text that you're seeing on the screen, when you selected that URL for Starbucks, it took you to that particular page on that GitHub site or that, that directory, that particular file on the GitHub site. So what I was gonna highlight real quick for the team is if you look at it in a raw markdown format, uh, the table itself is parsed in a manner that you can easily figure out what URL you're grabbing to get your data. It's probably gonna be, I, I would presume, Frederica, if you wanna add in there, um, just using, for example, the third, uh, uh, sorry, second method of downloading using the week number um, as an option. So you're saying like Starbucks, for example, you're creating the, the uh, object, importing from Tidy Tuesday's package, uh, loading the year 2021 and then the week 52, the system's going to know or the, the path that it creates, the URL that it creates already knows where that's located on that GitHub page. Um, if you're doing it manual, like uh, Michael had mentioned with the uh, uh, read our uh, object, the web URL that you're passing is similar or it's being managed by the Tidy Tuesday package itself. You Does that help know, at all? You would have to know this whole, this whole URL in order to use this method. Correct. And I found at least in most of the Tidy Tuesday posts, uh, either Monday night or that Tuesday morning, when you find it, they already have the link to the Twitter uh, or to the GitHub uh, page where you can find your data set. Um, so that would probably, you could just grab that and dump it in or just navigate to it and, and pass it that way. But it's really just managing URLs. Uh, a, a lot of what they're doing here is posting in a, in a central repository of all your data and then you just read it into your own local system that way. Yeah, and you have more information about the data in uh, the other two links beside the, the first one. And those are the data sources. The other two links that you find um, 
if you before to uh, the, the to reach the this page you have the the link if you go back to the previous page yes here you have starbucks drinks at the bottom for example and then again it repeats itself starbucks drinks and behance uh, uh, starbucks infographics those are the data sources sometimes is the um um so it's the repo of the the one who provided the data or uh the the website where to download the data the raw data and because you can even download the raw data and do it again by yourself and rebuild the uh the csv file and they provide you with uh, the script at the bottom of everything that makes sense to me so um, so coming here into this particular view, I see that under this column, this link takes you to that comprehensive introductory page. It has um, the user, it has graphics on it, a bunch of descriptions. This looked to me to be the source. That was the a raw data printed out in a PDF version. Um, and then some additional information there, article. Okay, I get it. Uh, anybody else have any questions on this approach? So actually not questions, it was a, just to add in. So something I found during last semester, John actually had a podcast for Tidy Tuesday. I don't know if you ever, did anyone ever listen to it already? But yeah, I, I was listening to it in the car, which kind of is good because I got to like kind of listen to basically all of them in one, but I didn't actually get to um, look at any of the, like the plots, but yeah like i was just looking at it um on my computer just now and it can like you, it gives you like the links to the plots and different things i can uh if you don't mind i can screen share it just really quick oh you have the podcast link okay <laughs> like, yeah so the podcast pretty cool Uh, any, what about any of this information up here at the top? Am I misunderstanding what this might be up here? Oh, these are, these are all commits and things. This is just the, the iteration of the, of the repo, right? Yeah. So these are different folders. folders. If you go down into the last one, I think you'll see that it's the same thing you were just looking at. This one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Milk types added. Okay. And then so milk type data, that's the most recent commit okay. to that folder, but the, the link on the left is to the actual folders. Okay. I, I usually don't, don't get inside the data folder to, to go here, but just on the home page of the repo, of the Tidy Tuesday repo, you find all these things in the reading. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so these are, uh, yes, the, the, the load of the data and everything, but you don't need to, to you, if you just go back to Tidy Tuesday page, uh, yes, there, if you scroll a bit down, you find that the explanation of the project and then you go still, you go further down and you find the same thing. You see, you you just need to you, you find all the data sets divided by years and everything, sure. and then uh, even further down, some interesting information you find uh, useful links, uh, the other other sources. If you want to do, for example, other uh, you don't you do, you don't need to use that data. You want to to see more or maybe have some examples to replicate with this data. Okay. So then to use this with, with GitHub and like your, with, say your local repo, um, what would be the approach there? Um, Do you wanna make a repo for your solutions to Tidy Tuesday? Yeah, I mean, is that what everybody does? Is that the idea? 
you make a repo for your for your solutions. I don't actually do Tidy Tuesday, but that makes sense. If All right, let's make a repo and make a new file, maybe for each okay. group that you want to participate, and then you can just include the code that was to um, read the data that we saw the read CSV. We're using the Tidy Tuesday R, so some code like that might be at the beginning of your um, file, your new file. And then as you, um, as you, when you complete it, you do a pull request with your final, your final code results. No, uh, you're not going to contribute your code into this repo. Okay. You're just going to maybe commit to your own repo for your own, for your own records. Okay. And then I, the, the plot, the result is what you would post on Twitter. That's yeah, you would do a pull request on this repo if you were if you wanted to contribute a new data set. Ah, okay. Okay. Uh, thanks for clearing that up. I was probably going to bankrupt GitHub or our studio by doing that. So. Uh, uh, you just you just need to fork the 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 repo. You fork it and you bring it into your account and then add your thing. I think you can. And then, so you just, have, yeah. and then it's just yours and you just you just deal with it and then uh, and then you never push it back right okay cool no no because it's not it's not required it's not like the, the there was a, a challenge like 30 uh 30 days uh chart challenge for example yeah. so that was uh allowed to push your your uh your chart um in in the main repo so the uh, and the procedure is the same you you create a new branch and then do your thing and push it and everything so is there a reason to um clone this tidy tuesday repo versus just um reading the data sets directly from it uh, sorry I'm not sure why you would want to clone the Tidy Tuesday repo versus just oh, okay. reading the data sets directly from it mm, using the, but, the code on the yeah, page. Yeah, it's, it's, you're right. It's not needed. It's not, it's not a requirement. Maybe I did it, for example, because I wanted to have some uh, direct links, but then I didn't use it, so I canceled everything and made a new one because when you um when you fork it you you have the the entire repo maybe you right. i don't know it's not you you're absolutely right it's not needed but if you want you can do it and have your all the things stored in your uh, fork and then you can add your things yeah. maybe yeah, if you want to have all the data sets, that would be the way to get them. Got it. Okay. And I think at the at the very end uh, with the Twitter post, I believe uh, if you want to share your code, that repo has to be public. Um, and that's a setting within GitHub. Uh, instead of making it a private, uh, I think is by default, you have to change it to public. Uh, so that for, therefore, when you, when you post your URL, anyone else uh, can follow that link and, and look at your source code as well. Um, you'll notice that a lot of people use Bitly that just reduces the, the size of the URL. That's just a namespace resolution bit. Uh, and I can help out there too. You create a Bitly account, plug in your URL, and then it'll spit back out some shortened version of it. That just helps on the character uh, amount on Twitter. So then, Ryan, a follow-up question on that. I had seen some conversations or heard something about people like one user might create a solution and then another user would want to modify that solution. Is it true then that, that the modifier is going to the original user's GitHub repo and modifying it from there? Or are they going to like this Tidy Tuesday repo? Oh, and well, getting uh, that's more of a citation. So you're just giving credit back to the user that you modified their code base to. Um, well, but oh. it, no, it's, it's less, and it's not about the citation as much as it's oh. like, whether they where they go to get the solution the solution script the solution file with a code file that, that was written by the user they're getting it from that user's github 
not, yes, that's from, correct. not from this Tidy Tuesday, R for Data Science, Tidy Tuesday, Master. That's, that's correct. Yeah, that's just what Kent was mentioning or, or what Frederica and Kent yeah. were talking about was instead of forking the entire Tidy Tuesday repo, you're just creating your own user space where you're, you're developing your own solution. Then you post that solution kind of as a showcase, hey, look what I did kind of thing to the rest of the world so everyone else could see it as well. And then add the hashtag Tidy Tuesday so that um, that starts to aggregate on everybody's feed. Yeah, but basically when you post it, you post uh, the, the PNG uh, or the SVG file on Twitter. And uh, if you want, it's not, you are not obliged. It's not compulsory that you need to add your code as well with your repo and everything. If you want to, because you did it in R and you have your repo and you collect all your study Tuesday, then you might want to add the line in the, um, in the Twitter explanation saying this is my code and add your e repo to, to share your code with the others. But no, not everyone does. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to give it a try. Um, the, I guess if the if the new data set comes out today or tomorrow, we'll see what happens. I think I, I, I it's either Twitter R or it's it's Tweet R. There's a there's a package to interact with the API of Twitter, and I I don't know Frederica. I know you post quite a bit about it. Um, do you use R to post to Twitter, or do you do it outside of the the uh, IDE? Uh I do it outside. Okay. No, I don't use the AP. No. Okay. I was just curious. I know that there's a way within R using the Twitter package. Tweet. Is it tweet R or tweet? I think it's, tweet I think R. it's R, R tweet. I think I Maybe saw that's it. it. Yep. I'm sorry. I'm messing that up. Uh, there's a way that you can add all of those attributes, the URL, the, the uh, uh, hashtags, et cetera within that post as well as the image, and then it'll automatically upload it as opposed to your feed. Um, that one, I'm not really sure how to do. So if anybody's used that in the, in the past, feel free to jump in on that comment. Okay. That was all the questions I had about it. So I know Kent says he doesn't do Tidy Tuesday. Does anyone? Will Frederica use them Tidy Tuesday posts like on your Twitter or? Uh, I uh, usually put on Twitter, uh, but directly on Twitter. So I open up Twitter and write a Twitter and uh, load the, the PNG file. And sometimes I put the code, sometimes not. Most of the times, um, because maybe I, sometimes I do it later. Um, you can add it in a comment. Enough if you uh, share it with R for Data Science Twitter account and then put R stats because uh, there is a boot that re share your tweet. And that's that's fun. I think it's very interesting because um, it, seem, it seems done on purpose, but uh, each week you have a uh, different data set, a different challenge. <laughs> Uh, they're never the same. So I've learned a lot. Uh, the only thing is, I, I said, um, 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 it's just a bit of, uh, so it's related with graphics. So it's not only that you are looking at data sets and you want to make a model or analyze the set for something. You need to make something nice and impacting. And the audience uh, is challenging most of the time. They're very, uh, you know, if it's not good, it's not good. <laughs> um, and uh, so you, you can add lots of things, you have pictures, and you learn many things because then the others share the code. So you, you may be able to replicate the code. It's nice. Yeah, I know like listening to the podcast, it seemed like no two people had the same graph for the same data. And like, I think there was even one where John had made like his or his plot was like an audio plot. It wasn't like, apparently it was just sound. It wasn't, I don't know if there was something visual, but 
it seemed like he was plotting it to like different sounds like 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 a different key on a keyboard or like a different dis- guitar string or something like that and it was just yeah so it it seems like it's very interesting I have to go back and look at like the podcast page to even just kind of see how for the same data people's plot can be just so different and yeah it seems like it's awesome I haven't actually looked on Twitter to see um, people's different plots but yeah I have to go on there as well and check them out Everybody for your help on that. And then, so Lydia will do chapter 12 next week. Okay. Yeah, finish up chapter 11 and do chapter 12. Because awesome. 12 is like very, very short as well. So I guess if anyone had planned to do chapter 13, they'd probably be able to start it or if you want to wait till the following week kind of thing. And then, hey, we could also, if you and I or whoever else does their Tidy Tuesday project, you can also include that. Yeah. <laughs> Prepare your down votes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what I was thinking. I'm, I'm not sure if I want to send out stuff into the Twitter sphere, but I could see maybe, you know, especially if I'm doing Tidy Tuesdays more state of practice and not with like really nice uh, end products, I could see maybe starting a blog down or having some way to post it and then putting it in the Slack. Yeah. It could be. Part of maybe my my resolution for this year is maybe to do to do that more. Yeah. Well, this might be a, a forum also to share um, and talk through it. But anyway, I think there actually is a, a Tidy Tuesday channel <clears throat> in the Slack too. It's not very active, but um, we can make it active. Yeah. Okay. Cool. It sounds like we have a plan. Okay. All right, I think we're good then, right? Anybody else yeah. have anything? Okay. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk to you next week. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.